Sheldon Dingwall, and he's going to give us a little tour of uh, his operation here. So where are we right now, Sheldon? Hi, we're uh, right in the shipping receiving area. And so this is a holding area for instruments that are about to be shipped off. And um, uh, we had to design this rack system. It looks kind of goofy and, and hacked together, but it's actually really nice on the bases. Um, they're nice and protected. Uh, they don't hit walls. They don't hit each other. And... Um, it's made with carpets from little kids' rooms and <laughs> plumbing insulation and dowels. So, well, looks like it does the trick. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it does a great job. Um, but it's funny, with everything, it's the simple little things that take all the thought. Um, yeah. Over here is primarily pickup manufacturing. And uh, this is a, this is a, um, a Japanese-made computerized... Uh, pickup winder, well, a coil winder. Yeah. We make pickups on it, but uh, it could have been making anything. Actually, it came out of the D TDK factory in um, Texas, so it was probably winding transformers or some sort of uh, inductor-based component. Yeah. And, and what are you, uh, what are you building right here? What is this? Would be a super fatty pickup. Okay. And um, so uh, uh, these were designed to sort of fit together. In, uh, in a shell, and, and um, these would be one end of them. It's called a tight end. Okay. And uh, here's, some, here's some more coils over here. So these would be an FD3 coil, and they're completely um, encased in copper foil, and it keeps the noise down uh, considerably. It's amazing how much noise you can eliminate with shielding. Okay. And oddly enough, um, it makes more difference shielding the back of the pickup than it does the front of the pickup, and that's because the pickup is sitting close to you, and there's a, compa a capacitance uh, coupling between you yourself oh, wow. <laughs> and your pickup, and uh, so you're actually grounding your pickup through the air yeah. and um, and causing noise issues, or you're acting like an antenna for your pickup. So by shielding the bottom of the pickup, um, uh, it, it decouples you from your pickup. And, you okay. become less of an antenna. <laughs> um, so yeah, this uh, this machine, when you uh, turn it on, I don't know what program it's designed for right now, but so we can control not only the speed that it winds at, and this is spinning like incredibly fast, 3,000 RPM. Yeah. Uh, but we do short coils, so it's okay to spin that fast. Uh, then we can also program how it lays the wire down, whether it's laying it down really fast or whether it's laying it down really nice and even. Yeah. And um, all those vary the tone of the, uh, of the coil, as well as the tension and things like that. Okay. And uh, down here I see you've got some uh, preamps and stuff. Here is a Z3 circuit. And um, I'm sorry, no, this is a, a Z circuit. So three switches. And a rotary, and there's our new um, uh, series trimmer. Okay. And it's a Glock and Clang circuit that uh, we get in there and we tweak some components. We uh, change the the uh, way the signal flows through the circuit. Okay. And uh, we've been able to make the active sound more like the passive sound, which which um, a lot of people want. Yeah. They don't want to. They don't want to have a tone change when they go to active. They don't want it to sound active. They want it to sound passive until they use their controls and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, we just build them up on these these cardboard cards, and uh, the whole circuit is assembled, and no solder splatter gets all over your instrument. Yeah. And then it's ready. These, to yeah, drop these are assembled again. coils, uh, waiting to go into their shells. And um, uh, being magnetic, it makes it really simple to <laughs> to uh, store them. 
Uh, most of what we do use neodymium magnets, yep. um, although we do do Alnico and we do hybrids that are some Alnico and some neodymium, depending on where we want that uh, the tone of each. Yeah. Um, now you'll notice that uh, some of them have circuit boards. Yeah. And um, so that would be on the uh, on the um, split coil ones. Yeah, that's the FD threes. FD threes, yeah. Okay. Um, and so the circuit board does two things. It, it pre-wires the coils and it holds them together and it um, also spaces them, gives them the right length. Yeah. Which uh, really simplifies that process. Okay, and then you just fit them in, in the shells then after that? Fit them in the shells, yeah. Okay. And since we're on that subject, we might as well just go over and take a look at, at these shells and how they're made. Okay. So, um, we don't have a casting couch, we have a casting room, and, and um, uh, so this would be a, a mold that would make a pickup shell out of, and the master for this was made on our CNC in-house, Okay. and then um, liquid plastic is mixed up and poured into that mold, goes together real carefully, and then it goes in this pressure pot here for uh, about 10 minutes at uh, 60 psi and what that does is is um, it takes any tiny little air bubbles and it compresses them to the point where you can't see them okay so it uh, it just uh, it's a it's a way to get a more consistent product and is it a fairly labor intensive process to make these pickups it is um, you know it's probably five minutes per uh, per shell yeah and if you were to injection mold them it would be you know less than five seconds per shell yeah but um, the, the problem is is that uh, injection molds are you know five ten thousand dollars and we have seven different pickup shells yeah so now we're talking seventy thousand dollars worth of just molds Wow <laughs> and then you know you don't you don't make one pickup shell at a time you make thousands at a time so so if we're talking a thousand pickups per run, then now you're you're talking seven thousand pickup shells, um, oh, wow. and we're just we're just way too small to do that. But um, but I really like the look of of having our own custom shells. Uh, do I have one here that I can show? I probably don't. Um, yeah, I don't have one in this. I think room. I saw some out there. Yeah, we we'll see some in the uh, in the other room. Um, it's nice to have our own custom shells, and it's nice to have our own custom knobs which have a surface and a color that matches those shells. Yeah. And so, so you make those those in house as well? We make those in house as well. Same same sort of system but um, a little bit more elaborate as far as um, uh, this has to have some pretty precise internal internal dimensions. Yeah. And so um, um, the uh, the molding system is a little different. And because uh, because the um, the, uh, the the molding process is a little bit imprecise. We leave excess at the top that we trim off later. Okay. And as you can see, these are these are more rubbery so than the assembly area right here. Yeah. Um, we use these we use these fixtures here that um, are taller than any hand tool. So if if um, there's it happens to be a hand tool on the bench. Yeah. Um, the body will never touch it. Wow, <laughs> that's you know, which can be a problem. Um, it, 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 as you go through the shop, if you start off with a piece of wood that's, if you drop it on the floor, it, it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. Um, and each step you go along the way, you've got more invested in it, more um, uh, labor primarily, but materials too. And you get to the end result, and if you drop one of these, well, then you've lost thousands. Yeah. And so um, as we get further along in the shop, we start to look for ways to prevent kind of uh, that kind of thing from happening, accidents and so forth. Oh. Um, so uh, body assembly is primarily here, um, and it would be taking uh, sub-assemblies like that uh, preamp that I showed you, um, and inserting them pickups, and um, and then eventually the neck goes on here and strings and so on and so forth. Um, and then a rough setup is done here, just the truck rod basically. Yeah. And um, then the base will sit for a day for for the truss rod to uh, to um, just settle in. We've got this gauge here that we made. We we tried to figure out a real 
quick and easy way of, of setting the truss rod. And yeah. When it was just me, I'd do it by eye. But um, as uh, I, I only do the final inspection now, as I was handing off um, the uh, the initial setup duties to to other people, yeah. I had to come up with a, a consistent measure. So just CNC machine this and um, three points. You set it down on the neck, and if the neck is too straight, it'll rock. Okay. And you can you can tell, and if it's uh, got too much relief in it, you'll see a gap under this pin here. Mm. So it's a real nice, simple, consistent system. Uh, this is our sanding area. And the guitars are sanded on a rubber surface. And these slots are for, uh, we, we hook up a dust collector to it that sucks the dust downward. As you can see, um, there is dust in the, in the shop, but it's actually pretty clean considering there are two guys in here sanding for six hours a day. Yeah. Um, set, uh, five days a week. <laughs> Um, and uh, this elevated surface or this angled surface allows the operator to be sanding like this instead of sanding like this. Yeah. So much easier on the back. Okay, and can you maybe talk about a couple of these instruments you have up there? Like maybe. Uh, sure, we've got, a, we've got a Prima Artist here. And this one's a waiting buffing. Um, so the surface has been sanded to about 1200 or maybe 1500 grit. And then, um, then it'll get buffed on the rough wheel first and that'll put a really nice shine on it yeah and then it goes over to the fine wheel and that'll put an incredible shine on it okay. it's um it's uh it's about a 45 minute process we've got it down to yeah which is pretty good considering i think we started and it was well the very first guitar i buffed took four hours <laughs> oh wow <laughs> things in here and then we'll, we'll zip out into the other area um here's where we do Fingerboard leveling, fret leveling, and nuts. And um, so this is an, this is a, a jig that holds the neck. Um, we'll adjust we'll adjust the uh, amount of relief to less than one thousandths along the entire length. Okay. As a matter of fact, when we sand it, we sand it to uh, under our, well under a quarter of a thousandths of variance along the entire length. Wow. <laughs> um, this is um, the primary woodworking area. Oddly enough, it's the largest area in the whole shops, um, square foot wise. Yeah. It usually only has one guy. Wow. Um, because we got a lot of machinery, one guy can do a lot of work. Um, can you maybe speak about this Prima right here and what uh, stage it's in? Uh, this um, this Prima has got its first coat of oil sealer. Okay. The oil um, helps to seal off the grain so that when the paint goes in. Um, it doesn't keep soaking in and soaking in and, and making the instrument really heavy and, and dulling the tone. Okay. So the oil just has a very light coat, gives it some nice color. Yeah, yeah, the grain is really popping out nicely. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is a really nice piece. Instead of just book matching it yeah. at the top, which is the normal way of doing things, uh, uh, wouldn't it be kind of neat if we book matched it and then flipped one piece so that we have a diagonal match? Yeah, no, that looks very cool. It's a very striking effect. And then here's the neck for it. And uh, we call this a smoke inlay, where it looks like um, looks like cigarette smoke sort of just wafting into the air. Okay. Not that we're promoting smoking, <laughs> but uh, I always liked the look of that uh, ever since I was a kid. And what kind of woods are in this, this neck here? Uh, flame maple. Okay. Uh, flame walnut. Yeah. And then uh, two Wenge stringers. Oh, wow. Uh, and then there's two heavy-duty carbon fiber bars down the center uh, on either side of the truss rod. Uh, really highly figured bird's eye maple. Yeah. And then uh, we have uh, a buckeye burl oh. inlay here that's been cut from the top. Did you do that yourself? Inlay yeah. this? Yeah. And then uh, not me personally, but but the guys in the shop. Okay. And then uh, the black matches. The black contrast thing. Okay, and what's that? Uh, it's called olive wood. It's a uh, pressure dyed wood that um, it's actually no longer available. So unfortunately, um, uh, it's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful product that we can no longer get. Okay. And we'll we'll find this up. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, could you look over maybe at some of this wood, the wood collection you have here? Sure. Uh, here we have a, some um, 
ABZs that are or ABZs, depending on what country you're from. <laughs> uh, they're halfway through their machining stage right now, so they haven't got they haven't got uh, control pockets in yet. Okay. But the uh, main holes are drilled, and then the neck pocket, the pocket pockets, um, and the control holes are done. And so they're about halfway through. This would be about the um, 20, 30 minute mark, and then and then we'll finish them off. Okay. Uh, wood storage is over on this wall here. Can you show us maybe uh, some of the uh, tops that you have here in the shop? Well, sure. What do you What do you like? What are your favorites that you have here so far? Uh, I really like the burl birds, which. Um, let's see if I can find one. Here's one that hasn't been glued together yet. But um, I like how the grain just sort of explodes out of the center. Wow. And I didn't really, when I first, I got one piece by accident years ago, and I didn't understand what was going on. And finally, um, uh, through talking to wood dealers, was able to figure out how to pre-order this wood so that, that you can get a consistent supply of it. Yeah. Because they don't like to cut it like this. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, in their opinion, it's wasteful. Mm -hmm. um, but in our opinion, it's, it's just gorgeous. Yeah. And I like the fact that, that I don't see it a lot on other people's guitars. Yeah, what about, uh, what about walnut? What do you have for walnut up, up there? <laughs> oh, there we go. So, um... If you look hard enough, you'll see faces in this. Look at, you know, it's almost like a bat. There's a couple of wings, there's a couple of eyes, and there's a couple of ears. <laughs> um, we don't spend a lot of time trying to see that stuff in wood, but yeah. uh, it's kind of neat when it does appear. Um, now, what would you use this for? Would this be a FEMA artist or an afterburner? This would be an afterburner, too. And mm -hmm. we've already pre-laminated on the, um, the uh, contrast laminate. Yeah. And that's their eight for visual so that you see that nice pinstripe. Yeah. But it's also there to reinforce this top, burl not being the strongest yeah. of woods, or worse yet, spalt maple, which is uh, extremely um, easy to damage. Okay. This solidifies it. Yeah. So it's going to be sitting over top of open, open space uh, over the tone chambers. Okay. So, you know, if you happen to beat on your guitar a little too hard, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be able to take it. Um, what about, the, do you have any Prima Artist wood here? end up on, a, on an artist yeah although typically what we do is we'd, we'd have the two pieces together so that uh, we'd have an absolute match between the top and the back yeah I don't think I think we've done one premier artist where we, we had an alternate back but that was the customer's choice not ours yeah okay <coughs> here's some more neat woods this would be a spalted quilted maple you probably can't even call that quilted. It's it's just wildwood. Yeah. There are some maples that are just so crazy and so off the wall that, that uh, mix of everything. Yeah. You know, name them. It's just ah, it's wildwood. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I mean, compared to some builders, you don't have that much wood here. Why is that? Uh, it tends to go back to the the fire. I had probably a four year supply of wood uh, yeah. prior to the fire, and it all got burned up, and it was gone forever. And um, so uh, we keep enough inventory to do, well, the wood comes in, it gets cut up, it sits for a month, yeah. then, uh, then we dimension it, glue it up, it sits for another month, yeah. and then we cut uh, neck blocks out. Here would be a, a neck block that uh, has its truss rod glued in already. Uh, it's got a contrasting layer on the uh, top. This would be a, an artist neck. Okay, is that babinga maybe? Uh, this is quilted babinga, um, flame maple, wenge. Okay. And that could be made into a five, six, four string, whatever you want? Yeah, that, that's the other thing was um, to keep things simple uh, from an inventory management point, yeah. uh, all the necks are made 
to accommodate a six string. Yeah. So if it's a four string, you just same block. Okay. So is it more wasteful? Uh, not really, because um, the headstock on a four is, you know, still going to require almost that much room. Yeah. Uh, we designed the six-string headstock to be as compact as possible. Okay. And um, and then you know if it's a five-piece neck, you're still using five pieces of wood, so yeah. it isn't as wasteful as it sounds. A couple of the machines. People always ask, how do you cut the fret slots? And currently, we're doing them manually. Uh, we could do them on the CNC, but but we prefer doing them manually. And find a prettier jig. Here's a pretty one. What we have is we have um, index holes. This is laser cut out of steel. Okay. So it's very accurate. We have index holes on either side of the fret. And the neck gets gets keyed into these two stops here, and then a cam locks it in place. And a couple of spring-loaded pins that you tighten up, and they support the neck. And then I'll set that down. And then there are two two pins directly under the blade, right in line with the blade and centered underneath it. And it's as simple as that. Okay. So this this head can float over top of the fingerboard, and this just rubs on top, and that that uh, guides the height of the slot as or the depth of the slot as it goes over the fingerboard. Okay.